All right, good afternoon again, and a warm welcome to the many Africa Center alumni who are joining us uh, as we speak for today's webinar entitled Drug Trafficking and Border Governance in Africa. My name is Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly. I am the Associate Dean and Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I'm pleased to be moderating this webinar, which is the fifth in a quarterly series that we have been putting on about border governance approaches to countering transnational organized crime. We've been exploring in this web series how border governance strategies can help counter and prevent different forms of organized crime. So past webinars in the series have covered natural resource related organized crime, the organized criminal elements of cattle rustling, uh, human trafficking and human smuggling dynamics, and uh, the market for small arms and light weapons. Um, so arms trafficking has been covered most recently as well. Border spaces, as many of us know from the work that we do, can be strategic areas for the actors who are involved in organized criminal activity to exploit. But border spaces are also places where the security sector, along with other state and societal actors, can collectively address security challenges arising from illicit economies with the communities that are most immersed or affected by these dynamics. So overall, that's what we've been doing in the webinar series. In addition, we've been interested in solutions that might capture elements that cross the different uh, pillars of the African Union's 2020 strategy for a better integrated border governance. So those five pillars of the strategy, which might be useful to keep in mind today as we're listening to the experts, uh, pillar one is the development of capabilities for border governance. Pillar two is conflict prevention and countering of transnational threats. Pillar three deals with mobility, migration, and trade facilitation. Pillar four addresses cooperative border management. And pillar five is all about borderland community engagement. So today in this webinar on drug trafficking, we're hoping from the experts we have gathered with us today to understand key actors involved in drug trafficking and place their activities into local uh, context, explore the ways that drug trafficking affects and involves different members of border communities, and discuss the ways that security sector actors can use border governance frameworks or approaches uh, to address insecurity that arises from um, drug trafficking in general. More information on our work on these issues can be found on the Africa Center's website under the Programs tab. I believe that the uh, web address for um, that portfolio landing page will be provided in the chat here on Zoom. And before we get started uh, and, uh, in, the, in the content and begin the discussion today, let me turn it over to our director, Ms. Amanda Dory, for a few opening remarks. Good day. Bonjour. Bon dia. Assalamu alaikum, Siku and Missouri. It's truly a pleasure to greet you today from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies here on the campus of the National Defense University in Washington, DC, where we're just waiting for the famous cherry trees to start blooming with the start of spring. My name is Amanda Dory, and it's my honor to serve as the Africa Center's director. I'm very pleased to greet so many alumni from all over the African continent and beyond today. We're delighted to be joined by an excellent panel to discuss drug trafficking, border governance, and the design of effective responses. These are challenges all over the world and comparative learning can assist in identifying solutions. As most of you know already, the Africa Center was chartered by the US Congress 25 years ago and we conduct academic programs and research related to the full range of security challenges in Africa. The vision that we're working towards is security for all Africans, championed by effective institutions that are accountable to all of their citizens. And the program today is conducted in support of that vision using our methodology of dialogue, peer learning, and seeking to catalyze strategic solutions. Before I turn you back over to Dr. Kat Kelly, I would like to quickly remind that our website continues to publish all of our latest research. It's at www.africacenter.org. And please check out our most recent publications, 
including one that's exploring the claims of the junta in Mali with respect to the level of militant violence there. We also have a brand new one that is looking at cults of personality in governance. So with that, let me welcome you once again and turn it over to Dr. Kelly to proceed. Thank you. So now let me turn to introducing our panelists, if they could come on um, with their cameras at this point, um, that would be great. Let me first introduce Mr. John Mark Puku. He is head of the Conflict Management Program in the Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center based in Accra, Ghana. He's also uh, in his final year um, as a PhD candidate at Rhodes University in Eastern Cape, South Africa, where he is studying small arms and light weapons control in West Africa. Uh, John has been regional coordinator for small arms control training programs at Kofi Annan. He has been on the training staff of national commissions for small arms in different ECOWAS member states and has done other capacity development projects in this work. Um, he's also specializing in beyond small arms and light weapons control, counter narcotics, regional security, border security management, um, and other security challenges. We also have with us uh, the Assistant Inspector General of Police, John Dugutse Esquire. He is Director of the East African Police Chiefs Coordination Organization's Counterterrorism Center of Excellence. He is an all around investigator, intelligence officer, and counterterrorism expert with 35 years of experience. He's also been an advocate or is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Uh, in Uganda and a member of the East African Bar Association. He's also VP of the FBI Associates for Africa in the Middle East. And as the author of a recent book, many of us have on our shelves called Countering Terror, The Law as a Potent Antidote. Um, so welcome to both of our panelists. We're delighted to have um, two seasoned experts with us to have this conversation. And I'll just jump right in and get started. Um, I'll start with Mr. Poku. Um, could you please spend about seven minutes describing recent trends in drug trafficking in your region, West Africa, um, drawing on some of your current research? So who are the major actors involved in illicit narcotics trade? What kinds of factors have led um, your region to become increasingly not just a transit zone, but a consumption market? Yes, in West Africa, the traditional prohibitive drugs are still in circulation. So you have your cocaine, you have your cannabis, you have your heroin, and so on and so forth. But increasingly, we also have uh, uh, amphetamine coming in and some of the new psychotropic uh, substances like uh, tramadol and also fentanyl uh, also uh, coming in quite a lot. But the, at the same time, even though we have not really reformed drug-related legislation in terms of the number of countries in the sub-region, we are under a kind of domino effect since the drug legalization, global drug legalization uh, campaign began. And so as uh, the UN, uh, UNODC rightly points out, uh, cannabis consumption is on the rise in the region. And under 35s are the worst hit uh, uh, cohort uh, in terms of the consumption. Most of the um, pushes relative to the transit of the pro prohibitive uh, drugs are paid in kind. And so they get access to it. So that also explains why they get used to it. But I'm worried more about the impact in terms of, uh, if you look at it from the macro and also the micro uh, perspective, from the macro perspective, the economics looks right. Researchers are talking about increasing tax revenue, even human rights, because drug use is now becoming a matter of choice and there is less arrest. But the catch is in the micro level where there is increasing observation of uh, uh, hospitalizations, um, psychiatric disorders, and also suicides. And so we need to take a decision whether we want the big bucks as opposed to saving 
uh, uh, the active population who constitute the workforce of the economies in, in, the, in the region. But let me also mention that uh, several other organized crime related activities have also impacted on drug distribution and also access to drugs by uh, actors. So for example, if you take uh, illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, what it's doing is to deny artisanal fishers from harvesting as much fish as possible. For that matter, it's impacting on quality of life in coastal communities. And most of these fishers are joining the distribution of drugs. They will go on the high seas and buy not only stolen fish, but also become the conduit for transmitting uh, 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 drugs from the sea onto land. Now, this also challenges the traditional notion of the ports as the uh, official entry point for uh, maritime trade. It's now involving coastal communities, and we need to think in a more innovative way if we really want to win the fight against drugs. Again, there are some studies that talks about West Africa being less safe than it was 10 years ago. What it means is that citizens are beginning to be concerned about the performance of our governments. And some of them are taken to banditry, they are taken to armed robbery, they are taken to insurgency. The conflict we see, the dynamics of it in terms of how it becomes protracted or drugs on is that uh, fighting uh, non-state armed groups are using drugs to energize their fighters. Bandits are recruiting people, arming them with uh, uh, weapons and drugs so they can attack. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned cattle wrestling. They, they, they do that as well. Um, again, women are also uh, in minority when it comes to drug use. But it's becoming increasingly clear that uh, once they are into it, they, they grow faster into uh, becoming victims of mental disorders and so on and so forth. Uh, last but not least, uh, I can mention the question of corruption and nonviolent nature of the drug trade. Where there is vi violence, it quickly attracts the intervention of the states. But where there is no nonviolence, uh, hardly do communities even uh, inform state authorities about the presence of drugs in these communities. And so we should look at drugs not as a piecemeal issue, but as an interconnected issue that requires drivers of social policy in multiple forms to contribute to addressing the challenge. Uh, I don't know if I've adjusted my seven minutes, but uh, I think I've said enough for us to chew on going. Yeah, forward. no, that's those are really great um, starting points for us to build on for the conversation, particularly your point about the fact that, um, as is often the case with countering transnational organized crime, one form uh, or one kind of illicit market is often um, exploited uh, by uh, criminal actors who are also involved in other um, illicit markets. And so the connection you make here between livelihood effects of IUU fishing, and then that pushes people to participate in uh, a different uh, criminal market, um, the drug trade is a really uh, well-made point. Um, I'm sure there are similarities, um, but maybe also differences in East Africa. Um, so speaking of that, let me move to Mr. Ndugutse. Um, if you wouldn't mind spending about seven minutes as well describing recent trends in drug trafficking in the East Africa region, um, your region um, and area of work, what are the key security challenges that have arisen from drug trafficking in Eastern Africa? Um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kelly. And uh, I want to also uh, greet and thank uh, the director who spoke a while ago. Uh, it was happy to see her again. Uh, but as you have rightly said, in this eastern uh, part of Africa, uh, of course, the trends we are seeing, we are not working out of isolation. When you look at the recent uh, UNODC um, 
uh, what they see as the recent seizures of cocaine and the other abused drugs, it has something to do with the effort of fighting trans-organized crime. Now, as you look at the East African region, the region is as attractive to international drug traffickers and those syndicates which are quick to exploit, of course, the non-existent or ineffective border, uh, border areas. When you hear what my brother said about the deep seas, we have Africa uh, has got more than 30 kilometers of coastline. You find that in those areas, there are no designated borders, and it is not very easy for anybody to, uh, to pacify all of those areas. So you find that these drug traffickers and other organized crimes are being uh, used because of this vast area. So you find that they are limited across borders and regional and the, 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 the regional uh, centers can't police them effectively. Now, the challenges as we look at, there are so many deficiencies in the criminal justice system that need to be plugged. Also, uh, you look at, um, you find that there, there is no similar balanced or integrated approach to drug control and framework. For example, you find out that now, like when you go in these countries in East Africa, you find we have got the a national drug authority uh, authorities or centers which their mandate is different from the anti-narcotics uh, uh, units which are to do enforcement. So you find that there is a disparity when everybody is enforcing this law, it becomes a problem. Now, also you look at the few resources are always located to drug control. Because as you know, we have recently passed into the, uh, the pandemic of COVID. So you find that all the effort is being put at developing the economies and trying to make sure that the people have good lives. So much attention is put on fighting this. So in so doing, it's become a challenge, the law enforcement, and to those who are trying to enforce the drug uh, trafficking. Of course, we are cognizant that when we talk about traf uh, drug trafficking, we are sure that they are those pharmaceutical drugs which are supposed to be used uh, by, uh, by human beings on a daily basis, and even in chemical uh, industries. Then we look at the contrabands, those ones which may not be allowed to come in. Then these, the narcotics and the psychotropic substances, which also come in, and you find that a given, uh, a given percentage some people are supposed to consume but because of abusing, you find that it becomes very difficult to control. Then, of course, uh, the international border controls, I said, are weak. That is when they are not seized. It, it does not mean that they are not passing through. They may be passing through with much, much, with no much uh, attention, but they come in. So also, you look at, uh, we have the, we lack the efficient rehabilitation centers. Those who have been uh, affected or have been victims of that, you find we have no rehabilitation centers. So at times you find we have a number of uh, people who have got problems with the, their heads or they are mad because you cannot contain them. But also, the, when you look at the, uh, the, 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 the monitoring controls, they are also inadequate. And uh, of course, this is something that uh, is, we are looking at as a challenge. And uh, this is also coupled with the uh, law enforcement uh, doing it uh, in a different way. As I said, you look at the enforcement <coughs> of fighting narcotics and the enforcement of looking at the drug, uh, the drug abuse and so on, which is legalizing. Also, uh, I think, the way we are, at the area we are in, we are looking at the drug matter as a security matter. 
which should be followed to the latter. But because some people, they don't see it as a security matter, they just look to the other side. And you know that if the drugs are abused and possibly the population is involved into that, they stop becoming productive. At the end of the day, the economies of the countries go down. And what did you see? There are some countries I know where you find that some of the streets are full of those people who have been intoxicated because of drugs and they cannot give anything to the, back to their country. So it is possible also to see that when you walk into some of these countries of ours in the region, you find some drugs are being hawked on the streets, even in the markets, not by specialists. And this is a danger where uh, you find that somebody crosses and goes across the counter, he requests to be given a drug and he takes one tablet two or two times and it is done without knowing that maybe he's causing trouble to himself or herself. Mm -hmm. uh, so many of these products sometimes are imported without authorization and are sold by hawkers, as I said. So, I, of course, the challenges are very many, Dr. Uh, Dr. Card, but uh, we shall be on discussing, I think, as we go along. And uh, to sum yeah. up, I want to say that this is a security challenge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Ndukutse. I think that's a point well made to the audience that we have here of Africa Center alumni. Um, and you make a really important broader point, I think, about needing to consider in policy responses um, the supply side of the narcotics trade. Um, so who are the criminal actors supplying this? And you mentioned the international and local implications of that. But also, what is the demand side? Um, and so thinking about responses that encompass both elements is really important, I think, to the point that you're making here at the end of your um, initial uh, response to the initial question. As you said, I think now I would like to turn to a second round of questions with our panelists to talk more specifically about policy responses. So let me go back to Mr. Poku. Um, could you start us off speaking about seven minutes about the kinds of policy responses that West African states have thus far pursued to counter drug trafficking or to prevent increasing demand for it locally? And since we have an audience of mostly security sector actors, you know, what can security sector actors do to best help their governments um, to learn uh, about what, what kinds of responses make sense in your regional context? Okay, once again, uh, in the sub-region, you cannot talk about regional cooperation without uh, the economic community of uh, West African states. Uh, on their platform and back in 2008, ECOWAS has adopted the political declaration on the prevention of drug abuse, illicit trade, illicit drug trafficking and uh, organized crime in West Africa. Basically what that does is to reinforce or invite member states to reinforce their commitment to the international drug control regime. And these are the three global conventions, the 1971, 1977, and 1988. Uh, if you put those together, you come down to two uh, strands of responses, one on the supply side and one on the demand side. Uh, but increasingly what we see is the law enforcement or an attempt to cut down the supply of, of uh, drugs. We are not very strong on the demand side. Um, care, rehabilitation, education and awareness and so on and so forth. Most of the countries don't even have a budget for mental health. And uh, those that are available are concentrated in the uh, uh, capitals or urban centers. Majority of the rural areas lack these things. Community nursing services, community mental health nursing services are just there in, in, in name. They are not working as uh, they should. Uh, there are countries that are doing well, but majority of them are uh, struggling in that sense. And then also the general awareness 
and efforts to also remove the frustrations of the youth that compelled them to succumb to all these attempts at drug use. These are very important. Uh, and so from the declaration, UNDP, UNODC helped to develop a roadmap with a series of activities uh, to assist its in the subregion to uh, deal with the drug uh, issues of drug abuse. Now, uh, much of it, or much of the emphasis, have focused on uh, investigation and uh, conviction building capacity along those lines. Um, but probably that is not enough. But I am glad that at least there is something in place that we can build on. Uh, going forward. And so as we talk about demand reduction, I think we need to go back to what we have achieved and see how we can improve upon it and strengthen the demand reduction side of uh, drug abuse. Um, and so with the security sector, as I said, the focus has so been on uh, empowering their capacity to um, support the judicial and investigative uh, system. And so much of the capacity development training relative to drug abuse have gone in that direction. But uh, there's also the rise of uh, investigative agencies along the lines of uh, preventing money laundering from proceeds of uh, drug abuse and also all sorts of organized crime. And, but there again, the infrastructure for doing this has been much more complicated. I mean, asset confiscation laws and the way it allows people who have never worked in their life to own properties uh, provides a very convenient way for drug barons to hide the ownership of the properties that they, they acquire from the proceeds of uh, organized crime. Um, officials can be bought or be compromised and all that are uh, in the way in terms of how to be effective in dealing with the drug abuse. So there are very practical challenges along those lines. But having said that, we also see a growing list of African countries adopting new drug laws in the framework of uh, legalizing. Uh, particularly cannabis. Um, Ghana tried, but the Supreme Court uh, last, uh, lately found an error in the procedure for adopting the law and has actually uh, quashed it. But most of them, more or less, uh, most of the countries foresee some revenue or international uh, uh, gain or the sale of uh, cannabis on the international market for medical and research purposes. And that is where the focus is uh, going. But as, uh, as I be began earlier on, the moment we begin to demystify the prohibition tag to drug use, we may not need laws to get people to use it. And that's what I was referring to as the domino effect a lot more people are going to go into because now some way, somehow, there is some level of uh, permission, even if it's at the uh, uh, high scale or global level, some level of permission is there. And uh, uh, you cannot be sure the extent to which people are going to uh, use uh, drugs. Some countries have also downgraded, for example, in South Africa, they use, they are allowed to use in certain quantities uh, and a few other countries as well. So the whole situation of uh, drug use is changing. It has started slowly and officially in particular countries. And when you see strategic countries getting involved and you know that uh, it's a matter of time that it may probably extend to lots more countries. Whether our security agencies and, and also our health agencies are ready to cope with the impact, I don't know. But that is a, an area that we all need to watch. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Mr. Poku. Listening to you sort of um, run through some of the supply and demand side elements here reminds me of in some of the other webinar series, some of the other programming that we've done at the Africa Center on these issues. We've referenced a really useful tool uh, by the ENACT Consortium called the ENACT Organized Crime Index. And um, this is an entity that uh, consists of Interpol, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, and the think tank Institute for Security Studies Africa. And every two years they do a uh, organized crime index um, that sort of tries to measure in, in the different country contexts um, the intensity of different uh, illicit markets, so including the narcotics or the drugs markets uh, that we're talking about here, uh, quite a few different ones that you've mentioned, um, but also tries to look at different measures of potential resilience. And so several of the things you've run through here hit on some of those resilience areas. Um, so law enforcement training, judicial training um, to enhance that coordination that you've mentioned is the somewhat more conventional um, you know, supply side approach anti-money laundering measures. Um, some, so the financial crimes element of deterrence um, is also a key piece, but also some of these community-oriented supply side elements you mentioned fit into um, some of those 12 resilience factors. So looking more at community dynamics, um, community livelihoods, um, you know, those who are um, falling into mental health challenges or difficulties as a result of the drug usage, I think could fall under some of those categories. So I think a link has been posted to that tool in our chat. Um, and um, let me continue with our discussion of policy responses now by turning to Mr. Ndungutse. Could you talk about what kinds of policy responses East African states have thus far pursued to counter drug trafficking? and prevent um, this demand for it locally. And again, if you can give us some of your reflections on what security sector actors can do in the domain of policy response to help their governments address um, these issues, that would be much appreciated. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, I think maybe uh, let me not take it uh, for granted that everybody knows where the region we're talking about. Uh, we are talking about the Eastern African region, but as uh, people may appreciate, in the 1998, the police chiefs of East Africa, now the big part, called the East African Police Chiefs Corporation, they formed a body that would be able to help in fighting transorganized crime and them sharing information regarding those transnational organized crimes, at the same time be able to operate together and they, and they maybe even do research to have evidence-based approach to some of these uh, challenges. So now, uh, as you may be well aware again, is that uh, this region, the same region covered by United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, and what we are looking at is something that brings up a solution to some of these problems with the way you, you brought them up, when in the opening remarks and the, and, the, and, and the director, we have heard about uh, human trafficking in Nemo and so on and so forth. Now we're on drug trafficking in relation to possibly terrorism and so on and so forth. So the new development uh, that uh, the rooms that are growing are that the region is being seen as the destination and transit to different countries. However, the key issue to enforce the policies to the latter rather than a uh, whole thing becoming a mess. That's why we are looking at it and make sure that we handle it uh, uh, objectively. So in doing this, there are efforts that are being done by the region and the, 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 the policymakers and so on to make sure that there is increased border control mechanism in the region of this stuff I'm talking about. Also, you find that we are trying to, to look at the to have the coordinated action by government agencies and institutions uh, of intelligence and regular security operations. So that you find that there are some fusion, uh, fusion centers which get intelligence on the drugs and the abuses and so on and so forth, so that they can be able to, to work and find a solution. We also have the enhanced capabilities of special drug units uh, throughout the region uh, through training and adequate equipment uh, where you find that you have such as the, uh, the, the K9 
uh, that are trained to, to be able to, to detect some of these uh, 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 drugs and X-ray machines at every entry point uh, where it is possible. They also increase awareness among the citizens about the dangers of drugs because it is one thing to be proactive and is another thing to be able to stop a problem that has already happened. So we are trying to encourage this increased awareness among the citizens. Also, uh, discussing with the youth, as my colleague from West Africa has said, that uh, uh, the youth are used as, as traffic agents, especially the students. So as we look at possibly at the end of the day to use the prostitution entities to make sure that we stop this from happening, we need to use also a soft approach by bringing these youth and maybe the students back online so that they can be good informants to be able to do this. We cannot fight this, we in law enforcement or maybe the drug, uh, the, 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 the national drug entities and everybody without involving everybody. Because this is something we should hide. And in any case, when you abuse drugs, when you hide, you'll be seen in the public. So we make sure that uh, we, we also do some courses of undercover uh, programs to be able to infiltrate in these cartels. Because as you know, these are organized crimes. And if uh, it is not done, then uh, all the policies we have in the place, there are so many policies we have, both which are regional and international, to be coupled in, you need to be able to make sure that uh, they, uh, they are looked at uh, uh, with a, a holistic approach. Then we uh, ensuring intelligence that continues to be ahead of the situation in the direction, in the direction and so on. Now, also uh, on, on that slide, uh, the policies, the law and the policies are enough but the problem, as I said, is enforcement. We are not short of laws or policies, but enforcement uh, is a challenge. Now, now, as a security sector, the, the, the best help we can help is to utilize the strategies of, uh, open source, uh, of open source, because this is a highly organized crime where you can at times, not get what's going on unless you are sure and get information from open source, and even others, you can do the research in that area. Then we need to employ more technology, because as you know, this uh, a drug that has brought from Southern America uh, to reach here, it is very difficult to detect unless you have got some technology and also these sources you need to employ. Then also enhancing cooperation and exchange of information with the countries. Of course, now uh, when we uh, we we go further to looking at engaging on national and international efforts uh, uh, to counter drug trafficking, we need to uh, share evidence, best intelligence, as I said, uh, and also uh, to have these things to carry out research in the designated areas that support transnational uh, national violence crime. Like when you look at the center I lead, the Counterterrorism Center of Excellence, we have had a number of research uh, uh, conducted, but all of this is evidence-based for us to be able to inform the public and the whole world of what happens so that we can be able to move together. So of course, now uh, in the East African, in the East African political cooperation, and the East Africa generally, we're engaged in the joint training and operations to counter the drug trafficking and other crimes that uh, are transnational. Uh, of course, as I said, sharing information with other regional uh, regions, uh, like the West Africa region, I know we have got the WAPCO, we share with them information, SAPCO, uh, Southern African Police Cooperation, CAPCO, and so on and so forth. In those setup, we share information, even including the Interpol, uh, Interpol regions and uh, so on, so that uh, in the whole world we can be able to, to put this one behind us. So, uh, planning together and operating together to counter transorganized crime is the way to go. Otherwise, we don't want to work in isolation because this is a crime that we did not manufacture and we are not also. Uh, uh, Privy to control it ourselves, we need to work together as a team.
So I think uh, uh, maybe without to, I know time uh, is not uh, our friend. I hope maybe if there's anything I could add on, I will be uh, too cold to do so. But okay. I think I can stop here and then maybe you can pause another question. Thank you. Yeah, that was perfect timing, uh, Mr. Duguthi. Thank you for running us through. Um, yes, the key point that actually I'm asking our two panelists questions about uh, West Africa region, East Africa region, but really these are challenges that cross the continent that are global. Um, so there are global financial markets involved. There are international um, and foreign actors involved in addition to some of the local or regional dynamics. And so, um, as you say, working together on this is really the key way to sort of transcend the borders uh, that can sometimes um, create some challenges to information sharing or to coordination. And again, thank you for running us through as well um, for EAPCO, uh, the genesis of EAPCO, how you work with the other police chiefs, um, cooperation organizations, um, and how those are sort of useful places where information sharing and open source research that's evidence-based maybe can um, be shared as well. Um, so thank you for that. I'm sure there will be more questions about that. In fact, I think I have one. Um, I'll stick with Mr. Ndugudse, um, and then we'll end with Mr. Poku. I just have one more round of questions. Mr. Ndugudse, I wanted to ask you a follow-up question about um, EAPCO. So could you spend um, six or seven minutes talking a bit more um, in depth about the work of EAPCO? What are you engaged in to enhance national and regional efforts to counter drug trafficking? Um, maybe you can talk about some of your projects or initiatives and in what ways uh, might security sector actors exploit specifically synergies in counter narcotics and countering violent extremism in attempting to confront the illicit drug trade? Um, uh, thank you, Kat. Um, uh, as I, I almost said, the East African Police Chiefs Corporation organization, IAPCO, uh, in its inception, it was created to fight transorganized crime. And these transorganized crimes that we mean that these are crimes which uh, cross borders. And with the wisdom of the chiefs then was to find out how do they coordinate, work together, share intelligence without going through some bottlenecks to be able to stop this challenge. Because as I said, these crimes are not limited to any geographical area. So in doing that, uh, the chiefs realized that without working together, it would be very difficult to do this. Now, uh, of course, time has gone and uh, crime has been increasing and of course changing and so on and so forth. Now came in the, the problem of terrorism. Terrorism that became a thorn in the meat of everybody in the world. Of course, this region became uh, one of the regions that had a fair share of terror attacks. Beginning with the, in the 90s, of course, I can give you briefly the history of what we had in 1980 when there was a terror attack in Kenya, uh, Nairobi, no for quarter, where people were killed, then followed by 1998, of course now in the same country, now you go to Uganda, the 2010 terror attack, that was the first international terror attack that was uh, orchestrated on Uganda. So in doing such, the chiefs again certainly established the counterterrorism center of excellence to be able to share intelligence, carry out research, operate together, and share experience of this vice. Now, in doing that, you find that uh, when we are looking at both the drug trafficking and the violent extremism, normally we, uh, uh, the problem we have been having is to climb the tree from the branches instead of climbing it from the trunk. We are talking about violent extremism, but we, within the region, we are trying now to inform ourselves that where does this thing begin from? Of course, there are stages before somebody becomes violent. Where it comes from? 
So you need to look at the, look at the vulnerabilities which people exploit and how they become radicalized. Then after radicalization, people become cognizant and become a cognitive extremism. From that, then they become violent. So in doing this, you find that the drugs are within the component because without having money, these crimes cannot be, cannot be moved. So in doing this, you find that the region now is doing much in, uh, uh, in uh, looking at the, the root cause. And now we are beginning to have the proactive nature of doing such. We need to go back to the communities. These young children and maybe those who have been, uh, uh, who have been uh, in, in fighting with the terrorists and they are back, the, the returning fighters. How do we bring them back on the board? So in doing this, you look at we, in the center, we are engaged at looking also the, what we do call the exit strategy, where we need to disengage those who have been involved in violent extremism. After disengaging them, then we, we, we de-recarize them. After de-recarizing them, then we look at uh, 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 rehabilitating them. And in rehabilitating them, it becomes another way of where do we put them again? Then we need to involve everybody uh, themselves, uh, the families, the public and the governments, and everybody in life. So that at the end of the day, before they are integrated in the society, everybody is moving at the same pace. So this is what you look at now uh, in, in, in having such a, a projects. We are looking at the, even the risk assessments and the financial implication brought in by drugs so that when we are doing this, we can be able to inform the world with much evidence that is evidence best how much you can stop this this problem then of course now uh, we, we we want to make sure that we build the capacity of the law enforcement personnel by addressing the knowledge and the skills and the attitude to enhance performance to detect prevent and the movement of all these goods uh, can be seen with everybody that can be able to give information. So, of course, as I said, we are trying to uh, uh, to do this, to mitigate this by looking at addressing the uh, the, 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 the 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 terror triangle. We normally call the terror triangle. The terror triangle where you find that there is a lot of motivation by the drug traffickers. What is motivating them? vis-a-vis -vis the terrorists. What is the motivation? So now, can we find out their capabilities? Do they have the capacity to carry out a terror attack, for example? What is it that is making them be bold? Are they abusing these drugs? For example, taking on a lot of morphine and they can fight as if it's been possessed. What do we need to do? So in doing this, we now deny them the opportunity to do it. By doing this, we look at what we would call the five Ps. We just prevent them from doing it. If they have done it, we pursue them. And by pursuing them, we need to look at how do we protect the rest of the people and the public. And we should be able to look at also to be able to project so such thing has happened. Can we stop this or is likely to happen? So in doing this, some of this, I may not uh, exhaustively uh, discuss it, but I want to implore whoever is listening to us and over there, you could look at the Counterterrorism Center of Excellence website, mm -hmm. where uh, I, will, you know, I will give it to you, put on the board so people can see, but sure. it is www.iapco ctcoe.org. All of this we can be able to discuss and be able to share and the, the stop this problem that is happening. Thank you, Doctor. And um, yes, thank you for um, talking about some of these linkages between 
drug trafficking dynamics and terrorism. Um, I think that relationship can be very complex. It looks different in different places at different times, but uh, you've summarized well um, sort of why, why thinking about that linkage might be part of strategic thinking and how to get ahead of some of these dynamics um, that are, again, yeah, transcending regions, transcending country borders, um, really global challenges. Um, so let me go for the final question to Mr. Poku. And I'm um, rolling us up to the African Union level. You've spoken a little bit about ECOWAS, which is a nice um, compare and contrast with um, IAPCO. Um, but could I ask for your thoughts now uh, in six or seven minutes on how an African Union strategy for a better integrated border governance to so this 2020 strategy, as well as um, policy measures like the African continental free trade area, how do these things that are being pursued on the African Union level um, fit into other responses intended to counter drug trafficking? What are your thoughts about the potentialities or the 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 you know pros and cons of um, what's being pursued on the continental level? A complex question, but let me try. I see both of them as uh, coming under various types of uh, regionalisms. Um, the Africa continental free trade area by way of uh, economic integration. And then the other one uh, using uh, uh, regional cooperation to address questions of fragility and also uh, on governing spaces in the peripheries of, uh, of states. But the um, AU strategy for better integrated border governance is accumulation of its past uh, interventions on border security uh, tinged with empowerment and integration. I mean, it, it refers to the 1964 decision to maintain uh, colonial borders of member states. It refers to its earlier decision to uh, invite member states to an, adopt negotiated settlement over border disputes arising between them. It also refers to its earlier border program, and then it connects more with integration. But staying with that alone, I see about two things. One, the, about the power-driven approach to border governance that sees anything beyond a particular country's jurisdiction as an enemy. And for that matter, make it harder for them just in case they decide to uh, uh, encroach upon your or jurisdiction. And from there, you can understand why border regions are one of the underdeveloped uh, spaces in our region. Roads are not properly done. Uh, social amenities like schools, hospitals, employment. You don't find these things uh, in border regions that much. Uh, to the credit of say, ECOWAS in West Africa, together with the Africa Development Bank, there has been investment in uh, transnational corridors, road corridors. And so uh, you find some roads cutting across countries, but these are just, uh, they pass through one of the main transit points. A lot more transit points are not developed or they do not benefit from uh, said programs. The typical relationship as far as border governance is concerned is that countries see each other basically as enemies. Some of them dig trenches so that people cannot pass through. Uh, Others who approve a crossing point without recourse to the other neighbor. Sometimes you see that your neighbor has authorized people to as exit point for migrants leaving their country and you have to respond and mount a post just to check who is coming through and that kind of stuff. So between the paper and what is on the ground, I think there's a long way to go in terms of uh, 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 developing border regions so that they, there's some, some sense of inclusiveness could be uh, attained law and commitment to the ideas of the state could be attained as well. The Africa continental free trade area by and large 
It's also an economic integration project, basically to expand economies by uh, extending the market opportunities of goods produced within the countries to markets beyond the, the countries. So there is a shared, uh, or let's say convergence in terms of how border governance and the ACF uh, CTA can support demand reduction. Uh, so I want to see border regions coming across much clearly as centers of commerce, centers of livelihood, centers of employment, away from borders being seen as uh, areas of crisis, areas of potential attack by enemies, and for that matter, investing more and more in defense and security rather than economics. I mean, on their own, a lot of border communities are integrating. You, they go to school on one part of the border, they work on the other part, they go to church on the other part. And why can't we build on these things? Why can't we see, let's say, Burkina Faso and Ghana, agriculture plantation on one side, agro-processing factory on the other side, generating employment for uh, both communities to work together? And if we have that kind of mindset, then trade and border governance can contribute to reducing the opportunities that compel desperate youth to go into drugs and so on and so forth. So um, this is how I see the convergence. And uh, uh, maybe we can discuss as the uh, Q&A is approaching. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for those comments. I think um, among many things I hear um, is maybe um, a suggestion to the security and defense community members who are listening to think when we're managing security resources, to what extent for dealing with these problems, um, is it the defense and security sector investments that are needed versus maybe the investments that other ministerial budgets might um, uh, be involved in? Um, doing in terms of community work. So is it health and infrastructure investment? Is it security and defense investment? Is it other kinds of investments um, that public resources should be devoted to when we're thinking about how to empower um, border communities to, to thrive and then therefore to um, maybe um, pursue livelihood options or living options, everyday life sort of practices that are not um, quite as subject to the limitations of national borders. Um, so that's an interesting set of questions that you bring up. Um, I know different countries have, um, through different agencies and entities, tried to pursue a multi-pronged approach in this way differently. Um, I know there's some interesting examples from Benin's um, integrated border agency that they've created um, in, in your neighborhood, Mr. Poku, and I'm sure that there are other examples that I'm unaware of um, that are taking creative approaches and multi-sectoral approaches to these things um, in other places. So that um, concludes the moderated part of our discussion. Thank you to both of our panelists for really insightful and wide ranging remarks.